Thank you. Here's my excellently named talk, JSOF. Uh, good news is, is it's not an acronym, so nothing you have to memorize. Oh no. There we go. Uh, so when I uh, when NodeConf kind of tweeted this out that I was going to be doing a talk about this, I, I got one response, which you know that was a little a little a little disheartening. You know why why would you not want to use JSON? JSON is very easy to use. It it seems like it's it's a part of JavaScript almost. It's technically a 1999 standard, but so why would you not want to use it? What would you use if you weren't going to use JSON? Anyone shout something out? Really? It's like I'm David Blaine. I knew you were going to say that. I knew it. I really knew it. Um, well, anyways, there's plenty of alternatives out there that actually are much, much better than JSON, and they're not XML. So we're going to talk about those this morning. Well, anyways, my name is Michael Paulson, as it was previously stated. And yes, that is a Fight Club reference. I do work at Netflix. And not only do I work at Netflix, but I have pictures to prove it. Uh, that was a technical HR violation. Apparently, you're not allowed to lay on you know, the receptionist desk like that. But does any, who here is not familiar with Netflix? I think I, see, I may see a hand back there. Anyways, well, what we do is we take DVDs, and we put them in the mail, and we ship them across the United States. It's like a huge infrastructure. It's pretty awesome. So. Uh, you know, I, every single time I tell people I work in Netflix, I get the same question over and over again. And it actually happened last night, which is just fantastic, which is, do I get a free account? And I do want to set the record straight. No, I don't get a free account. Uh, it was described to me last night as disgusting. So sorry. Sorry about the disgusting non-free account. But you know what? It's OK. I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm a bad negotiator. I should have held firm to the free account. Anyways. I'm also part of the Node Benchmarking Group, Benchmarking Working Group, which is a hard phrase to say to begin with. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. So I have a problem, or I guess technically we have a problem. And the problem is, is that we have data that we need to get to people or to other servers. And so like specifically for Netflix, we have this, you know, this data store that has videos. And I have to take it, and I have to get it across the cloud. And so how do I do that? I got to turn it into some sort of reasonable format that goes across the cloud, go to the other side, and then reconvert it back into the structure that it was. And then now I can display it to the user. So that kind of sucks, right? You have to do something just to undo something. And so kind of if I were to repaint that whole thing into one picture, it's really between these two points that we spend a lot of time. And that's the serialization and the deserialization of data. And so. I'm assuming that everyone here is familiar enough with JSON that I don't have to explain exactly what it is. No one's asking this question. Uh, so I'll just tell you, like, ha who here has actually thought about or written a serialization of JSON or a parser? I know Mateo has. Someone else. OK. Well, anyways, let's just talk kind of like what, what actually happens underneath the hood. So when you give, when you give JSON, like, dot stringify a video, what actually happens is it first type checks. What am I stringifying? OK, so I'm going to go from an empty string into adding in a uh, you know, parenthesis. And then I'm going to go through every single key. I'm going to escape it, make sure I don't have any double quotes messing up my JSON. Then I'm going to go through every title. There better be commas. There better be colons. Everything kind of gets set up. And that's kind of how it goes. So it has to go through the object all the way through every last item. And the exact same thing when it comes to parsing is that it has to go through all of it. So you get a big string, and the first thing it does is it looks at the first character. And technically, valid JSON can't start with an array, but JSON.parse it allows you to, or you can do a string and all that other stuff. So it, it checks out what you're actually using, then it goes through every single key, one letter at a time. Make sure you have a colon, because the colon's extremely important, because you know when you do data interchange formats, you want nice delimiting things to help us read it. Uh, and then goes through the, if it's, a key, if it's a string, it has to make sure, escapes it, everything's good. You better have a comma. Make sure you know you got to have your data nicely formatted for, for the parser. And so it does this, it has to do this. So if that means if you had a 100,000 or a, a 100 kilobyte string of JSON, it has to go through every single character. Like it can't, there's no two ways about it. It can't skip any of it. It can't partially serialize or deserialize it. It has to go through the whole thing. So that means you spend a lot of time doing stuff. And so kind of what I'm hoping today is that we can uh, get past that. So let's instead of having the JSON, let's turn it off. 
let's talk about something else. So flat buffers. Has anyone heard about flat buffers? A couple people? One or two? All right. So anyways, I'm sure more people are asking this question. Uh, and so flat buffers, it's a binary serialization format that's not human readable. That's kind of something you should probably start expecting from data is that you shouldn't be able to read it. So how does it exactly work? I think it's, it's a little bit easier. Instead of trying to explain how it works, we can just build an algorithm ourselves of roughly how it works. And so let's take the exact same object that we were serializing in JSON, and let's just remove the keys. So now we just have the values. Well, we can't use an object anymore, so what should we use? Anyone? Who's paying attention? If we just have values and we need to put them in something, what do you put them in? Yeah, an array. That's awesome. All right, crowd participation. So now, the thing is, is I don't want to actually have in my code, you know, data sub zero is my title. Data sub one is my ID. Data sub two is my star rating. Like, that would be very crappy, because if you changed anything, you'd break your whole system. So ideally, you'd want some way to access this data, and you don't have to worry about how it works underneath the hood. So if I called, say, title, it should return Luke Cage for me. I don't have to think about where that's at in my data. So let's build that interface. So I think everyone kind of understands how the JavaScripts work, right? Anyone here not familiar with JavaScript? No, all right. So let's, we're going to create a constructor, and it's going to take in a single value of data. We're going to save that off. And so now we need to kind of create the methods to access that. So I'll create the title method. And what should we return from the title method? Can anyone give me a shout out? It's, yeah, data sub zero, all right. And so the same thing with star rating. Star rating was the what item? What was it again? Two. Oh, that's pretty good. We have people actually listening. So just a quick PSA. You should name your functions right now. I'm not naming my functions. Uh, you know, this IDE of PowerPoint is just not the best. So because later on in life, something will throw an error, and you're going to get anonymous function called anonymous function called anonymous function. It's going to suck. So just name your functions. But right now, I'm not naming my functions. Uh, so that kind of example was trivial in the sense that it's not that useful. Like, why would we just send a single array, and why would we build an interface around a single array? So what happened if that single array actually had a lot of data in it? It had profile settings. It had uh, profile icons. It had other videos. It had a bunch of stuff in it. It doesn't matter to, to your interface what's inside that array. It just knows how to understand a video object. So how would we alter the that's that previous code? All we do is we'd actually take and we take our constructor and add one more item, which is offset. We need to know where in our array our video starts. So we're going to save that off, and we're going to update our title method with the offset. So now, instead of calling sub zero, we just call offset, because that's where our title's at. And same thing with star rating. We add a two to it, a two to the offset, and boom, we have the star rating. So kind of the point I'm trying to get across here is that you can have an array filled with stuff. And that array doesn't have to be objects. It can just simply be binary data. It, just, it can be whatever it is. And at some point, you just point to it. You point somewhere in there, and you can call title. And what should come out? Hopefully Luke Cage, if you point it to the correct location. And so that is essentially what flat buffers does, is it provides a way for you to wrap a binary blob and for you to have like, nice methods to call and get data out. So instead of dot title, you'd call dot title as a function. So just a little bit different than, than JSON. And that's a, that's a a big difference, because you notice in the constructor, I never once like, went through any of the data. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to go through every single piece of data, make sure you actually provided me a title, an ID, or a star rating. I just simply pointed to it. So I mean, it's literally just a pointer to a block and say, that's, I'm that. I can, I can understand that. When you need something, I will then start parsing it out. And that's a very important concept, because first I'll kind of address the UI. If you think about a UI, or at least the Netflix UI, what we have is we actually have a title for a row, and we have data URIs. Like that's, that's about all we show you on our, on our UI until you actually interact with it. So if I sent down a whole bunch of JSON, which is what we do, because no one building a UI would just simply send down only the data in your viewport. What we actually send down is all the data that's kind of needed for you to scroll around a little bit. And so therefore, we're going to parse all of that, all the synopses, all the titles, all that everything, just to show you a couple box arts and a single title. So it just doesn't make any sense. Like, we spend a lot of time. And we actually proved this at Netflix. We had a really low-end television device where we actually stopped using JSON, started using some C-struct binary encoding. 
and we saw dramatically better effects because it was just, it didn't have to do as many network requests. We could pack more data into it. The amount of memory footprint was significantly smaller because you're only dealing with binary, not objects. It's, it's nice, but for us, I think at least at this conference, we probably don't care about the UI as much. Probably a little bit more concerned about the server. And kind of in that Steve Ballmer thing, I've been hearing a lot of this lately, which is microservices. Just microservices. Come on, let's do this. Microservices. 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 Right? I mean, they're good. They're, they're, they're real things. I, was, I wasn't as good as Emily's. I'm not. It's not as awesome. Um, but the good news is that, uh, I mean, this, this kind of data interchange format works roughly transparent with microservices, except for you can take a couple you can take some advantages of things you can't do in JSON. So I built out some microservices to kind of test this whole theory that JSON is slower than flat buffers, because it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to actually do it. Because what happened if I only got a 2% speed up? Would you want to change all of your infrastructure to use flat buffers as opposed to JSON? Probably not, it's not really worth it. So I, I built an experiment. The experiment, you can find it here on GitHub, uh, Michael B. Paulson, flat buffers, benchmarks. It, uh, it's, it's, I, the readme is completely out of date, so if you go there, you're not going to use the readme. Um, I don't know. I'm not good at maintaining those things. But So essentially how it works is that we have two microservices, a Lolomo service and a rating service. So everyone's familiar with Lolomos, right? No? Well, good, because you shouldn't be. It's a Netflixism. So let's go over it. A Lolomo is a low, a list of, a list of movie objects. That's how we kind of say it internally. But technically, it's not really a list of list of movie objects. It's actually a list of list of recommendations for movie objects. But nobody says Lolo Romo. That's way too much. So we just say it Lolo Mo. And I technically made the upgrade from Lolo Mo to Lolo Romo. So that actually makes me the Brolo Mo or the Lolo Bro, depending on how, like, you're kind of where you're at in the United States is where you put that. And we also realize that. It's technically not a list of movies, but you know, legacy is a really powerful thing, so we still call it a list of movies. Anyway, so I have these two services that I built, and I have an aggregator. That's kind of a pretty standard node operation, is that it calls a bunch of different services, takes in all the data, you know, it'll call one service, get that data, look through it, call another service, merge that data in, then hand it back to whatever is calling it. So the aggregator does the exact same thing. Calls the Lolomo service, and when the data comes back, it has to parse it, go through it, get every single title, get their ID, and then send it off to the rating service. The rating service responds with all the ratings, and it's able to merge that back in because it's user-specific data. That's not something we can't hard code, because if the user changes it before they make a request, and we say pre-computed it 12 hours ago, it won't line up with reality, and that's not a good user experience. And then, of course, on the other side, I made a whole bunch of clients kind of just call into this until I maxed out something. And the general results from all this were a bit surprising and a little bit confusing at first. And so just so everyone knows, I did this on an M3 large node with, well, technically uh, five M3 large nodes kind of calling into each other. And so the results really were that JSON, I could kind of max it out at 64,000 videos a second. It's about as fast as I could get it to go. But flat buffers, I could max it out at roughly 220,000 videos per second, which is a decent improvement. But that's not the weird part. The weird part is that with JSON, I could, I, my CPU was kind of pegged in the 90s, so 92 to 95% of the time I was, I was just running, it was just, or I was running at that level at all time. But the I.O. was only around 50% utilization, which means that if I wanted to even compress my data, I was going to have to take a hit on videos per second. So I couldn't shove anything else onto this. Whereas with flat buffers, I was only using 40% of the CPU, so I actually had a lot more room I could have probably played because I was using all the I.O., so I was maxed out, because uh, M3 large for AWS is a 500 megabit communication pipe, and so I was completely maxed out. I couldn't go any faster. Therefore, if I, you know, I would have built in compression all that, I probably could have saw that 220,000 go up to about 400,000 videos, which is significantly faster than JSON. It's actually rather surprising that I was spending that much time serializing and deserializing. Because when you build aggregation platforms, that's really all it's doing, is calling some off-box service, pulling it in, deserializing it, understanding it, calling something else, putting it into it, and then sending it off. So that's a real cost you're incurring, because 
My other one was parsing every single synopsis, every single title, every single piece of data that it did not care about. Whereas the flat buffers, I only need to know the length of the arrays and the IDs of every video. And so that was a rather small amount of information I had to parse. And so I did all this communication over TCP. I didn't use HTTP uh, just because I wanted to try to like, just maximize how much I could get through. And so it's good to kind of understand this is kind of where the, uh, the magic sauce is, is when you use uh, these type of communications, you get an extra benefit that you get with flat buffers that you cannot have with JSON, which is if you've, or first, who here has worked with TCP just directly? Anyone Ethernet gone build your own TCP like? All right, nice. So anyways, with TCP, you have a four, like a usually, or something like this. If you're going to send over TCP, you have to know how big the thing is you're receiving. So I did the first four bytes to how big the rest of the stuff is. Then one byte devoted to whether I'm JSON or not, and then the rest of it is just the message that I'll be receiving. And so that way I could take it in and I know exactly how much to parse. And when I was dealing with JSON, I have to get that message, then I have to convert it into an object, and then of course I'll descend into the videos, into the IDs, gather them all up, send that across the wire to my rating service. When it comes back, then I can update all the star ratings. But then I have to take that object and re-encode it into the message, because I can't just assume that my previous buffer is going to work. I can't just write in place, because I'm more than likely going to run out of room, because I went from different length uh, integers, because the integers actually have different amount of byte taking up in JSON than they do in, say, something like flat buffers, because an integer can take up anywhere between one byte if it's doing UTF-8 all the way to uh, eight bytes without the comma. So it's it's interesting how it works in JSON. So you kind of have to be careful. So then I have to re-encode this TCP structure and then send it off back to the user. Whereas with flat buffers, I could just point to the message and say, hey, you're a Lolomo. All right, well, I understand that. I'll start crawling it. And then I'll get all the, all the IDs out of it, send it off to the rating service. The rating service will come back, respond. I can just take that data and just put it into the message. I don't, I don't need to worry about that, because this message will stay the exact same size. My original TCP structure that came in still works. I don't, I don't have to alter any of it. And then I can just send it on its way to the user. So this makes a very efficient kind of communication pattern, because it's, it's, like, it's, it's like minimal zero copy that you can do in Node, at least currently. So it's very awesome. And so the, kind of the, the, the big takeaway I wanted to take is that life's kind of about trade-offs. Like I get that not everyone has the same problems we do at Netflix. At Netflix, we have our last public, publicly stated numbers, I think, were yesterday. So we are in the mid-80s for millions. And so that's a lot of customers. And that means that these people, they scroll. They don't, you know, 85% of our requests are asking for more data about the Lolomo. So that means that a lot of it is just simply people scrolling, which means that if we have poor JSON parsing, we're going to be spending a lot of time parsing JSON as opposed to giving users good experiences. And so. Probably not the same if you're just doing a pet project. I'd probably use JSON if I was just doing a little quick project because it's just easy. But at any sort of scale, I'd not use it just because it's outrageous how much time and money you will pay to use JSON. And it's really not that convenient. If you think about it, you have to figure out a field, right? So, OK, I need to know a field in my data structure. Well, what do you do? You either go to the service that creates that data, or you console.log it out and go, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's the field I want to use. And I was doing that during the development of this. I'd keep forgetting what are the fields on my video object, because I had to fill them in at various points. But then when I created the flat buffers kind of schema for it all, I actually just started referencing that. And I found it significantly more convenient to have a schema than I did having the flexibility of JSON, which I've always been under the illusion that that was much, much, much nicer to have all that sweet flexibility. Because I, I don't know about you guys, but I was traditionally kind of raised in the Java world, and then I broke free. I thought dynamic languages were crazy, and I started using them, and I thought strict type languages were crazy. And now I've kind of done this weird full circle where I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, they're not that bad. They're pretty neat. Anyways, this is the second to last Fight Club reference I'll make. That's my Twitter handle. And if you like Node and you like doing kind of bigger Node projects, she's a good person to reach out to at Netflix. And that's JSOF. Turn your JSON off.